<laughs> oh my God, you want to die laughing. So I um, am in the middle of writing, for lack of a better word, um, you know, just short stories. I, For about a year now, I've occasionally put um, like restaurant stories out on, on social media just to see how people would react to them. Because I don't want to ever look like I'm copying off of somebody. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think Anthony Bourdain set the tone for how it works for chefs anymore. And so everybody is trying to live up to that. So yeah. I write mine, edit mine, everything else, and then put them out. And some of them are really sweet and nice and and beautiful and people love them. And then the other ones are like, I actually fucking sound. <laughs> and people <laughs> seem to, to really enjoy that too. So as you called in, I was penning a letter to Sister Rosarita, the nun in fifth grade that about beat the shit out of me for telling her that I could hire people to do sentence structure and spelling. It really wasn't necessary that I was perfect at it. <laughs> she about beat me to death. That is awesome. <laughs> how, how arrogant of you to think that you could hire me. I was like, but I can, and I have. I'm telling you, and I don't know if we've ever covered this, but I don't really believe so. In fourth grade, I was doing a paper. And, mm-hmm. and you know, and I was I was in an elite school just like you were. And so the expectations are pretty high. And my mom's a school teacher, you know, all these other things. My aunt's a principal. My uncle's a principal. The expectations were too high for somebody like me. They really were because I didn't want to put that much effort into it. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so I... I hired the lady that lived about three blocks from us. That was a, uh, what's, what's it called? Like a, a corporate executive has their firsthand person. It's not a secretary, but it probably was back then. It would be something on the lines of the chief of staff would be my guess. Right. So she wrote my paper for me and I turned <laughs> it in. And, <laughs> and I know that poor teacher spent so much time trying to find out what happened. But I don't see there being anything wrong if you are not great at something bringing other people in. I just, I don't see any problem in that. Mm-hmm. Makes sense to me. You know, yeah, I mean, think about it from our perspective. We both own companies. What if we thought we could do everything? No, there's not, first right. of all, there's not enough hours in the day. <laughs> right, And second exactly. of all, can, can you picture me designing a logo for some client? <laughs> I would be right. I would be grumbling the entire time I read that brief where they're like, oh, we need to right. look luxurious and fashionable and modern. I'd be like, dude, right. go fuck yourself. <laughs> exactly. There's no such thing as classic and modern in the same. <laughs> so I have... I, I can't say I've always done it, but when I could afford to do it, I would rather just hire somebody that was a pro. So mm-hmm. it's so much less problematic. So anyway, that's what I was working on, penning my letter to Sister Rosarita, and I was not awful to her or anything else, but I was pointing out that perhaps, perhaps I may have had the right idea. <laughs> That's a nice way to reach out to someone after this many years, I guess. <laughs> oh, she's dead, so it doesn't matter. She'll come mm. haunt me in my sleep is what she'll do. I'll feel my knuckles getting cracked by a ruler in my sleep, and I'll know she's <laughs> there. <laughs> oh, God. I know. Isn't that crazy? Okay, we were talking about something on our last deal, and we got cut off, and we were supposed to get back to it, and I don't remember what it was. Do you know? I was telling you about the time I got heckled by a guy who just yelled out Tupac. And I was just standing there going like, (laughs) come on, man. (laughs) Better insults, please. (laughs) But see, I think that's pretty solid. I see. Now, I I disagree with you there. That one's pretty solid. So you should have come back and said, no, six pack. Pulled up your shirt, show him a six pack. But. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> have you seen <laughs> I could have pulled out a six pack of beer and told him okay here yeah. <laughs> there you go <laughs> let me teach you to be more creative I was I always found it funny that the mouthiest people were in the audiences were not the smartest is mm-hmm. that fair that is and because they they're said- not I'll tell you why because I think it's because tell they're me. not self and self-aware enough to understand their stupidity <laughs> 
<laughs> in their own head there is no other right. voice going like hey you might need to read up a little bit more before you start screaming <laughs> but don't you find that their girlfriend or boyfriend if it's a girl or girl mm. you know whichever way it works is giving them the look like shut the f up you sound like an idiot and they mm. keep going like they can't help themselves so have that you ever happened. given have you ever given anybody the stage where you go okay you think you're funny come on up here I'll give you two minutes. No, okay. I have I've, not. <laughs> I've done it, and and inexperience would would say, "Don't do that. Don't give them the mic," because they don't know they suck. And if they're that inebriated or high, they don't yeah. want to give you the mic back. So I thought it was really smart, <laughs> but you know, I made fun of them. Did you ever see Saturday Night Live where Joe Cocker was singing and John Belushi get, is behind him basically making fun of him? Mm -mm, I haven't seen that one. It's it's worth looking at. I pull it up on YouTube. Joe Cocker, beautiful voice, but when he's, you know, sings, his hands look like he's having, you know, an epileptic seizure. And so John Belushi was behind him making fun of him. And that's what I did to get the guy off stage is I oh, stepped behind God. him and did it. Yeah. <laughs> So the no. battle, the the battle of wit, though, because mm. obviously you think quickly, I think quickly, so we can get people pretty quick. But how do we keep that from escalating to you know they want to come up and fight us? That's the that's the question. I know that's the worst part. The weird part was that he had a bowl cut. So oh dear I kinda, lord, I kind of stopped my set and I was I went after his hairstyle for like 10 minutes. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> no, 10 minutes is an exaggeration. I probably just did a minute or something on his hair and I was trying yeah. to get back to the bit I was doing till other people yeah. in the audience put their hand up and they were like, do me, do me. And I was like, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so they were all like, can you insult us for a second? <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Okay, that's pretty solid. I would just be interested because I was never a heckler. Like I, my kid's mom and I were in Las Vegas and for some reason they put us in the front row, but you know, she was six foot tall and drop dead beautiful. And uh, so the guys asking tourist questions, you know, Hey, where are you from? But he was phenomenal. So there was no reason to do that bullshit. Right. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of the low end of, Oh, I, I forgot a couple of sentences in my act. Let me get my shit together. Hey, where are you from? What's your name? How many kids that? And that once damn she's crowd work. I hate fucking right. crowd work. <laughs> Cause you never know what you're going to get. So she um, opens her mouth and says something and she has a twang from North Western, northeastern Oklahoma that is unmistakable about like this. And she's loud and on top of it, drop dead beautiful. And holy mm -hmm. shit, that guy did 10 minutes with her. And he wasn't insulting mm -hmm. much, but you know, I mean, how do you how do you let that go? Oh my God, honey, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> And I think he may have done the what blender of life did you end up in and end up being perfect? What do your parents look like? Because <laughs> <You know? laughs> it does happen. Every once in a while, you get this magic combination of DNA from mm. two improbable sources, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, he had, a, he had a ball with her and I just kind of sat there where, where I would, would get heckled from a comedian um, we had this bar that brought in high level comedians. So they were, you know, let's say 40 years ago, they were 1500 a night. So five grand a night now. Right. Mm -hmm. And there would, there would only be 20 or 30 people in the audience. I mean, it just wasn't working, but you know, they had to earn their money and they had to do their 60 minutes. And so yeah. they would get into a hilarious conversation with the audience rather than the working the audience. Mm -hmm. They'd find somebody who could work back with them. And then it became a duet. I thought that oh. was pretty, pretty smart. Yeah. That is nice. Eh? I know. Yeah. And they were good. I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't amateur hour stuff. I mean, they, they were, they were solid playing to the smallest houses they'd probably played in since they did open mic at midnight in New York. The best part about a uh, New York club was I was in the front row and the comic asked me, where are you from? And I said, Oklahoma. And he was like, man, get the fuck out of here. Not with that accent, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I would have said the same thing. I would have thought you were fucking with me. Okay, that's awesome. 
<laughs> well, I yeah. did he jump on you for the lunch? No, he didn't. He actually moved on to the guy next to me, and he was like, because that guy, that guy was my friend from UCO. And he was like, where right. are you from? And he said Oklahoma, and he was like, see, that's how you need to sound. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck you did there. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Well, I, you know, what are we known for? Being overly friendly, loud, and opinionated, right? I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. We are. Yeah, all things good. So I don't know on the circuit where I ever was that the, the hardest room I ever played um, was a place called Mason City, Iowa. It sounds like a shitty little club where you're going to play 50 or 75 people, right? Uh -huh. 700 people showed up. Oh, wow. Right. But they were all ranchers and farmers, so they don't laugh like city people laugh. Mm -hmm. You know, every person in the place was white except one of the other comedians. And I mean, every single person. I hadn't been in that whitey of a crowd in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> so I do my set and I honestly think I kind of suck, which is very rare because I did um, caricatures with Velcro pull-off costumes. So I would come out and I'd be one person. I would turn around, pull it off, throw it on in this box that I had on stage and then no. turn around and do somebody else. And and it was like uh, 40 minutes of, of lousy late night TV commercials included. <laughs> and so it usually hit really well. And if you didn't like every character, you liked some of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got polite, polite applause. Like I would expect at a London theater. Oh, we've seen better. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I go to get paid and the guy was like man that was fantastic when's the next time i can book you in and i go were we at the same show this, <laughs> I, there, there's nothing about that that was fantastic i just i couldn't wait for the hour to end and he goes oh no everybody loved you no yep but that's a conservative I mean, ranching audience isn't it <laughs> where they don't right. really like showing emotion <laughs> right but it tells you a lot about a lot of different things other than comedy where you go, I'm not reading these people right. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Yeah. And and I remember there being one broken speaker. I was waiting mm -hmm. to go on stage and the guy before me was was not killing it. You know, so you know you're going to go to the depths of hell and have to pick it back up. And this broken uh -huh. speaker is all I could hear and there were tables around it. So that's how they heard the comedian. And I oh, still wow. seem to enjoy it. Yeah. You got to have good speakers. Your audience sounds like the corporate gigs where the HR is like talking to you just before you go on stage where they're like, no politics, no bad words, <laughs> no this, no that. You can make fun of that guy. And I'm like, you do realize I don't work here, right? I don't know who the fuck that right. guy is. He might be your boss, but I have no <laughs> jokes on him. <laughs> right, exactly. Do you have some jokes you'd like to write for me before I get up there? I think corporate gigs you can make money at. And if mm -hmm. they know what kind of training, you can figure out a way to manipulate that in there. But yeah. if you look at what it takes for you to write material, practice material, go up and do it, and still hear whether they're laughing or not, so you make a mental note of what worked and didn't work, and yeah. have somebody else film it, and then evaluate yourself on film for three damn minutes worth of work. <laughs> If you did that in the corporate world, man, you would be the king. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we put that much effort into something, but yet I can't get Dave away from the water fountain talking about the basketball game from last night when we're all under a time uh, crunch? <laughs> that is where you have to be. You have to do the motivational <laughs> talk bit as well. <laughs> right. Let me tell you a quick story. Do you mind? I hope you don't mind. Um, so I'm in I'm in Henrietta, Oklahoma, this tiny town that evidently has a methamphetamines problem because I was at the court and there was literally hundreds of people there on, on uh, the ankle bracelet court deal where you got to come check in. Oh, nice. Why I said that, I have no idea, but I wanted to set the scene for the high school. So <laughs> very, very low expectations after high school. So I'm in the room and I'm talking to the kids and I'm giving them, you know, the actor story and the restaurant story and everybody seems interested. And the whole time I'm in a home ec room, so I'm making food while I'm doing it. So everybody's okay. interested because they're going to eat something delicious, right? 
And so I've worked, I've worked this act. It's about 45 minutes. And at the end I do a Q and a because it's high school. You know, I don't know what high schoolers think anymore. And I, I don't even know what my own children think. So they're going around the room and everybody's asking these great questions. And I'm thinking, how is there such a math problem in this town until this one girl who's maybe not stunning, beautiful, but she's definitely above average attractive. Mm -hmm. She goes, well, I would like to move out to California and be an actress. What's your advice? And I said, Ooh, I'll have the lobby, right. please. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody your whole joke on that. And then I'll go on. Go ahead. Tell them the whole joke. Oh, it was that stupid thing where a friend of mine was telling me that he knows this person who I'm till date hoping wasn't his daughter or someone related to him. <laughs> and she comes up to me and she's like, oh, I heard that you're right. Can you help me out? I was like, what do you like to do? And she was like, oh, I want to be an actress. And I couldn't shut my mouth. So I just looked at her and I was like, I'll tell you the same advice I give everyone who wants to be an actress. I'll have the <laughs> latte, please. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the most accurate. Look, that is accurate. The reason I own restaurants is because I knew I was going to have to go back to work at them. So I would rather own them than work at them. Mm -hmm. the, the reality of that situation for this girl, I said, oh, do you, have you done some film or theater? And she goes, well, I did one show here at school. And I go, oh, you've got to be careful. I go, look, this, this, isn't, um, this isn't even the, the Hollywood of 20, 30 or 40 years ago. I go, you... You can end up in terrible, terrible situations. And, and I don't want to scare you or keep you away from doing it. But, you know, you can just go to Dallas. They make tons of movies in Dallas and commercials in Dallas. Or you can go to Tulsa or Oklahoma City and see if you're good at it before you go to Los Angeles. Because, you know, you may, you may not know you're good at it yet. But I don't want to tell you not to go. But yeah. let's try around here first. And I don't think most people realize we have a huge film organization um, in this right general now vicinity. Alone, right? Yeah, there is, there is, it's not a glut. I wish it was, but you know, there's enough. If you really wanted to work all the time, mm -hmm. you could probably pay your rent. No, That's wow. as good as it gets. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But not modern day rent, like 10 years ago, rent. Yeah. No. It, no, so but, it's, still fun. but it exists. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. They're absolutely screwed. It is, a, it is a curse to want to do that kind of stuff. And, you know, what you and I did is, is so you go, the, you go the writing route, you mm -hmm. do performance, um, you've done TV production, I've done TV production. Yeah. And do you think I wanted to work a teleprompter, honestly? No. And we did the <laughs> hand, hand crank teleprompter. I'm so goddamn old. We did hand crank teleprompters. And I'm watching the newsman as I'm doing it. And he seems to be slowing down on purpose to see if I'll slow down. It's kind of awful. <laughs> Those guys are and, annoying. Huh? I've had that one oh, yeah. where the actor reading slowed down. And right. I had to go back to help him catch up because he lost his place. And I was like, Jesus yeah. Christ, this is going to be another take if you continue doing this shit, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Exactly. And I don't, I don't know how many of those, but I, I also worked on the big old cameras. So the big, huge mm -hmm. ones you used to see in television studios, those are ones I moved around, but they were light as a feather because of the mm -hmm. hydraulics. And now oh. the smaller cameras are a little more worrisome, but they've solved that with stabilizers and everything on the inside. But, you know, they looked real jerky for me back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they were hard to make people look good. Yeah. You know? Um, so look at look at your shot on here. You have what's called headspace. I have headspace. Here's what normal mm -hmm. people do when they shoot things. <laughs> In case anyone was wondering, that was Sean just doing a close up of an eyeball. <laughs> and you know they just they just don't know any better. And until you learn, I mean, you look you worked for a much more prestigious place than I did. I worked for Cablevision. You worked for the BBC. So that would mm -hmm. be like. BBC's bastard stepbrother who went to America and failed. Hey, by the way, <laughs> that was exactly how they treated that production studio because it was not the stuff that you saw on BBC One or BBC. Oh, really? I was on like BBC <laughs> Four, Five, Six. Sometimes it, you were the old show. <laughs> sometimes it didn't even qualify, but they didn't want to use the video footage because it was so bad. They just put us on BBC Radio and they were like, "Tell your jokes there, you idiots." <laughs> oh my God. 
<laughs> okay. That's awesome. Let me let me tell you the worst TV job I had. So you were on basically ESPN, the Ocho. And I, so when I'm doing cable vision. And so I get this guy and he meets with me and he wants me to be an interviewer on a show about authors writing books. And I go, okay. You know, it's like any actor. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can do that. No problem. Just let me know what the books are. And so he has hair that, and he's pale white, like a heroin addict. Let's cover this stuff for real. And then jet dyed black hair, but no. it is parted on one side, kind of like a parrot. If they laid down their <laughs> parrot hair. And so, so I can't look at him seriously because the hair's comb. It's literally the worst comb over I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, so do you interview people too? And he goes, oh, yes, I do. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Well, I didn't, which, you know, and I was which just, camera angle do they shoot you from? I know. <laughs> Let me stand that side and talk to you. <laughs> pull back. Pull back further. <laughs> so... We get to our first gig and I don't realize that, you know, I've got to handle all the equipment and everything else, get it all set up. And then he basically turns it on, you know, white balances it and then shoots me. And mm -hmm. I have a terrible problem remembering people's names. I mean, I just, um, I can't remember their names until I've met them maybe 10 or 15 times. It just doesn't work. And so I'm sitting there and I'm trying to memorize it and memorize it and memorize it. And I was a really good looking young boy. So I was maybe 21 or 22 at the time. So I would do these phenomenal interviews with these female writers and they mm -hmm. would be thrilled with everything. And then I would have to go in closing, you know, to, to close out the interview. And then I would have mm -hmm. to go cut three, two, one. Okay. What's your name again? And they would lose every <laughs> bit of respect that I had gained in the last 10 minutes. Do you know how angry they must be? <laughs> <laughs> because everything had gone perfect until that point. <laughs> until you didn't remember the, the damn name. <laughs> right. Everything looked good, though. That was mm -hmm. the thing. So I could do the interview, and I knew the, to give it enough time to cut, you know, and tape everything. Because we were still taping back there, and I don't think we were editing, like, modern day on a computer still. I think we were mm -hmm. on, a, on a machine. So about three days into our first convention and I've done 20 interviews and I'm murdering it. And I still can't remember a single person's name. And you know, they are all heckling me back in the back room going, Oh dear God, he's good looking, but God damn, he's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is exactly what you and I would have thought had they read one of our scripts and had us interview. You'd be like, mm -hmm. this guy, why doesn't he write it on his hand? You know, <laughs> but I didn't, you know, I didn't know. Do you know the I secret know to that, Sean? What's I that? write things on my hand when I'm on stage, which is in red pen, so that it doesn't show yeah. under the lights, even if I look at it. Oh, hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I wasn't smart enough to do that. <laughs> so, and I was, by the end of it, I was slightly humiliated, but thrilled to death that I had been filming for three days. You know, I mean, that's, nice. that's probably the most on camera work I'd ever done. You know, mm -hmm. 12 hours a day, three, three days, and I was working the whole time. You're not sitting at crap services eating food you know, <laughs> putting on putting on too much weight to wear the same pair of pants the next day but it was so what i learned out of that whole thing and i think that helped down the line when i did my first book is i'd had a year of listening to people of how they get published how they do this how they do this and you go oh i can go around about most of that you know i, I don't have to do it their way <laughs> oh wow well, you use that to learn as well huh <laughs> Why, why not? I mean, tell me any situation in life you can't learn something from, no matter how humiliating or embarrassing, you know? No. Hey, look, I was just doing plumbing in the bathroom before I got on here with you. The women's sink was leaking. And I hate to break it to all of you that want to own restaurants. That's what I actually do is I fix shit. <laughs> <laughs> is it perfect? No. Is it good enough? Yes, Sister Rosarita, it is. <laughs> 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 this this sister has really scarred you, Sean. This is the fifth time you've caught oh. her up. <laughs> Dude, here's the thing. She literally, um, and I don't know if it was on purpose or not, hung me up on a coat rack. She was so mad at me. And I don't really, I don't really remember what I was doing, but I believe I was cheating on a test. Which, <laughs> which I don't apologize for. 
I have found out in the corporate world, that's how we make money, is we cheat on the tax. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Everything this lady got mad at me for as an adult proved that I kind of understood business better than you would think. Yeah. Isn't that weird that everything that they teach us is right and wrong? <laughs> the lines are so blurred by the time you start working where I'm like, sorry, yeah. what? <laughs> Why was right. I not supposed so, to use a book to refer shit to when I'm writing this fucking exam? <laughs> exactly. Right. Because <laughs> any other situation in life, I am able to do that, right? And... So if you and I, you and I have written scripts before, mm -hmm. why would we not look at reference material to show us how to outline it and everything else? It is ridiculous to think that in our own mind, we were going to remember and come up with all of that stuff, which is what we do for exams. That is so unlike what, especially now. I mean, now yep. between Google and AI, um, I'm sorry. I think the way you and I may have done it probably worked and we're 30 years apart. I know. <laughs> the weird part was I used to get like all the, there were so many times where pieces of scripts were thrown at me because it was in the wrong format. When we right. wrote OK Governor, the first episode, right. the software did all of the formatting for me. I was just typing in the lines that both of us discussed. Like, yeah. I didn't have to nice. do any of the indenting, none of that fucking stage right. instructions, all of that. At certain right. points, the software is intelligent enough to ask me if there were any instructions on stage. Right. And I was like, OK, why the fuck was I yeah. learning all of this by heart? <laughs> I, so part of that, I don't know. My, my wife always tells me that I give people too much information. So like, if you ask mm -hmm. me about something, I assume you're as smart as you are. And I go, well, here's how it worked for me. I did this, 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 this. And, and if you have any questions, you're going to call me back or text me. Right. And then I'm going to mm -hmm. send you back a voice text that you have to figure out because that's, that's the way it really you, works. Sean, the Riddler is usually what I have to label it as. Because <laughs> exactly. I have no idea what the hell you did. <laughs> and if it has anything to do with software, computers, or anything else, mm -hmm. I send you a voice text that you have to figure out what it says, and then you give me the correct answer back, right? Yep. It, it goes both ways. I just do not understand why we don't teach people how to collaborate that way in school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I, for the life of me, I don't understand it. So in, in science, you get stuck with four people in class. And I know you, culturally, you guys are looking for the best people to partner with. Culturally, we want to do it ourselves. And that yeah. is the biggest difference between the two is our weirdness of thinking we can do it all by ourselves. So we end up with the biggest dumbasses on our teams because we don't think we need anybody. And you guys are mm -hmm. looking for the best team, which is mm -hmm. why your economy is growing and ours is not growing very much. I mean, it really does make sense in the long run. But um, mm -hmm. so by the end of it, you end up doing the, the whole thing yourself and going, these guys suck. And you go, yes, you chose sucky people. Not that they yep. sucked. That's who you chose because you know, weren't thinking it through. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's, it's a weird deal. I'll hear people here go, well, you know, Working as a CEO is like running a baseball team and your kids, you know, you pick the best people and put them in the best places. And I'm like, are you really comparing Sandlot baseball to running a corporation? <laughs> well, he has a point, Sean. Just listen. <laughs> right. But but here's what I would say nowadays, though. Back then, you only had the kids in the neighborhood. We have everybody all over the world you can get now. Yeah, there are people on my team they, that I've never met in my life or work from countries I've never been to in my life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I would like some good fatouche. Tell me how to make that today, seeing as I've never been to your house before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is, it, I mean, you think of the way that both of us have worked over, you do it way more than I do, but we've just never been afraid to go bring people in from somewhere else. Oh, yeah. It's easier. Yeah. A lot of times... The problem is that I don't really pay attention to the different culture thing and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, he knows his job. I'm looking for a designer. You know how so, to design shit. If I see a couple of your designs, I'll know whether you're going to be able to understand the brief that I wrote. That's it. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. My funniest one is I hired a Muslim guy to help design my weed cookbook. And I was okay. like, are you OK with that? And he goes. Well, I'm not okay with it for my family, but you can hire me to do that. Yes. 
Do you remember <laughs> there was one was time to... where I had to text him from your phone because yeah. we had like a some sort of weird communication gap? <laughs> oh, and well, so what was happening is he used a software that we don't use over here. Mm -hmm. And so it was making some words look blurry. You remember that? And we had to take pictures yeah. of it and send it. And he was like, oh, wow. Okay. But my text over here looks great. And you go, that's not helping me. That is not <laughs> helping. Because <laughs> I'm looking at final product. Because this is only stage two or stage three in the final product. But yeah, mm -hmm. you were great communicating with him. I was I was getting to the point of frustration where I wanted a new person. And, he, and he did a great job. Yeah. He, hey, did a he great was job. sweet enough where I tried to explain to him. I was like, dude, it's not you and your system it's all of our systems that we're looking at it on <laughs> right. yeah yeah we just it's not working we need a different pair of glasses <laughs> is what we needed just a different pair of glasses lord <laughs> that was fun that was a good one to do sister rosarita what would she think you I know. hired a muslim from another <laughs> country she would have thought about it in not our version of the imposter syndrome. She would have thought actual oh. imposter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she would not have liked our entire conversation about that. I can honestly tell you. Here's the, here's the thing. She had been in nun school with one of my aunts. And these are the things you find out later in life. And mm. my aunts were both brilliant. I am not. I have a great personality and was really good looking when I was younger. So I took the easy way on everything because you mm -hmm. can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I won't lie. That, that's the, it's the truth. I believe me, I've got one of my children probably doing a similar thing, but he seems to have come around. So yeah. <laughs> are you talking about my former intern, by the way? Don't you dare. I may be. I may be. <laughs> <laughs> looks and humor will get you most of the way there it really will okay. oh sure <laughs> you have a, like develop a decent enough personality and if you look normal you don't even have to look good just wear decent clothes and look fit right. the occasion that's about it yeah. have them be clean and and have some manners I, manners are a big one you know mm -hmm. that's a that's a huge deal and you got to be able to communicate so <laughs> What else would you like thinking, to talk about today, my man? I was thinking about this the other day about, I think I was asking Alex about it, like how my attitude changes depending on if I'm around both of you, my risk yeah. tolerance and my business decisions and the way I raise capital and finance debt are completely different. Then when I'm here, it kind of takes a more con conservative approach. Oh, yeah. It like... What I was trying to get at is how much the people around you influence your attitudes, your positivity, your negativity, all of that shit. It was pretty. So let me ask you, let me ask you a couple of questions on that. So is your risk tolerance less there because you're the only one? Whereas over mm -hmm. here, you can spread it around a little more and you're around people that naturally take risks. Yeah. My risk tolerance in Oklahoma is way higher because I have all of you around. Right. Plus, you guys also have a little higher risk tolerance than, so my base itself is slightly higher. Whereas when I'm right. here, it's just me. And part of it is also, I guess, that I'm the only male member in the family. So I'm like, oh, shit, right. this might all just land on my shoulder. So I'm even more careful. And right. that kind of is detrimental to trying to grow and expand certain things. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. I would have, like, I have to consciously think about how I would react if you asked me that question or Aunt right. Alex asked me that question and then re-engage and see what a the stupid decision I made here. <laughs> right. I, I think that's probably pretty normal. I, I, so mm -hmm. I'll give you this weird example. So I'm in Ireland learning how to make cheese. Mm -hmm. And we get this guy in that makes butter, like artisan butter. And, uh, and he's telling us about it. And somebody in the crowd goes, yeah, we've got this yank over here. And he goes, oh, I didn't know that. You look like everybody else. And I was like, oh, thank you, I think. I didn't know <laughs> how to really take that. Um, and he goes, the French guys teaching the class say, look, you don't have to wait till you go to America do something great and everyone in the class said bullshit yes you do <laughs> that the irish wouldn't take on anything new 
And I think what they meant by that is the adventurous Irish all went to America or Australia or Canada or the UK. Who was left behind were the super conservative, we just have to do whatever it takes to not lose the land. And that was, yeah. they couldn't get out of that survival mentality. And I think when you mm -hmm. get back home, you know, hey, you're you're looking at what you got to take care of in front of you yeah. every day. I, I can't mess up because of this. And um, I'm pretty fortunate that that most of my risk taking on things I've lost on were pretty low. So, you know, you you, you kind of roll the dice with a thousand or <laughs> two or three or five thousand dollars. But, you know, 50 is a whole different ball game or 100 is a different ball game. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting I don't, I don't to see, know. Like hanging around like people here who are mostly the corporate types who work for some company or the other. Mm. They have careers, Sean. So I yeah. know that they clock in and clock out. Whereas anytime they right. look at me, I'm looking at my phone for something or the other because someone would have emailed me, <laughs> text me, asked me a question. Right. They're like, is there a time where you don't get questions? And I'm like, probably when I'm no. dead. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the time zone. Well, and, you know, they just don't have to do that. Some big grinding wheel, you know, mm -hmm. is making that money. I don't, my oldest son got an internship at a company here called Chesapeake Energy. And uh, and I never understood how they made money because you think it's an energy company. They make money on oil. But they were yeah. known for going out to auctions and paying three times the normal price. And no one in business can afford mm -hmm. to pay three times the normal price and make money but they would arrogantly walk into an auction and go hey you all can go home because one way or another i'm taking this deal and mm -hmm. people would sit there and run the price up on them because you know knowing full well they're going to do it and make it worse for them but because of the arrogance and so my mm -hmm. son was like i said while you're there just do me a favor and just see if you can figure out how they make money and he's like dad they make money in oil and i'm like <laughs> no your grandpa made money in oil these these guys aren't I, I just need to know what it is and and it turns out that they made all of their money trading oil futures which is not oh, well. what you're supposed to do with your investors money right but mm -hmm. that's how they were actually making their money and and so come to find out the guy that owned it was was a financier or a finance major he wasn't a okay he wasn't an oil guy and he wasn't a geologist mm -hmm. And then it all starts to make sense but you know i'd never thought to look into his background because he was from a family of long-term oil people yep i have met him i have met him in his life <laughs> yeah i knew him but he didn't know me from anybody he always wanted to own part of everybody's restaurant and i wasn't going to sell off any of ours so you know there was no reason no reason to sit down with him i, I didn't want to be one of the cool crew <laughs> it just oh, wasn't God. My I, I was forced to hang out with him because my old boss used to hang out with him <laughs> right Oh, God, yeah. Oh, you could tell. Yeah, he would be a he's a, he was a magnet for everybody that were deal makers because he liked to make mm -hmm. deals. Um, you know, making deals and running a business is not the same thing. Isn't Chesapeake like right now a penny stock or something? Or is it back up to a dollar? I truthfully, I don't know anything about them anymore, but you, you don't hear anything about them. You know, I mean, they're mm. they're no longer in the bankruptcy news every day. So somebody must have done something. I think Carl Icahn bought a big part of it. And that guy takes no shit from anybody. If he thinks he can run it, yeah, he'll cut costs and run it like a regular company. Mm -hmm. I wonder how crazy, many layoffs are there the moment he bought it. <laughs> it... uh I thought that was going to turn into a new university, their old campus. But, you know, they built like, yeah, I mean, they built too much too quick. You can always watch when people are on the way up and everybody's all impressed and you go, oh, let's give it five years. And they go, oh, you're a mm -hmm. pessimist. You're an asshole and this. And you go, okay, we'll see. <laughs> I'm a realist. <laughs> right. It's just no way to run a business. I mean, I'm just too old for that shit. You know, I've seen it 20 mm -hmm. times and it, and it works out the same all 20 times.